Um, as I was thinking about this verse and meditating on it and seeing what the Lord um, wanted to talk to me through it, I was reading it and it says, um, I, wanted to put into, I wanted to read into a context. I didn't know what the context was, but um, kind of started reading a little bit more of Isaiah, the prophet, what the prophet was trying to tell God's people at that time. And then this, this uh, chapter starts with Isaiah telling them that someone will come and destroy them, but then that, that uh, nation would be destroyed. And as I, Isaiah was talking about the nation of Assyria, who would come and destroy God's people. And right after that, on, uh, so then right after that introduction, that someone would come and destroy you know, God's people, and then they will be destroyed, would be destroyed. Um, Isaiah encouraged them. And well, Isaiah told them first, hey, this is happening because um, you, put, you put the trust in somebody else besides God. And the reason why I saw that is because in Isaiah 31, so Isaiah 31, it says, O to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in the chariots because there are many and horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look at the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. And so Isaiah is telling God's people that the reason why they are going down is because they are putting their trust in Egypt. They're looking at the, the, the earth, the, the, the land of Egypt, and seeing, oh yeah, they can, you know, they can help us to fight the Syrian. Um, we, should put, we should put our trust, our trust in, in Egypt because they will help us. But... Uh, the prophet is saying, no, you should put the trust on the Lord because he is my stability. He is the wealth of salvation, um, knowledge, and wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is hard. It's my treasure. And I'm thinking of it, and, and I'm thinking of it and says, what is it that today in my life I am doing it, that I am putting my trust in somebody else besides, or in someone else besides, besides the Lord? And I thought of, you know, my own job. And uh, the company that I work with, so there, are, there are some people that are leaving the company because, you know, the, because it looks like they're, they're perceiving that um, other companies are giving them a better compensation plan or being, you know, just easier to do loans um, on the other companies. And these are very um, top producers. They're just leaving Chase. And I'm thinking about, man, do I, do I go to, I don't know, do I go to a different bank just because they're going as well? What, what is that that the bank, that the other bank have? that these people are going there, and do I stay here? You know, Chase is, Chase is a technology company, a very more technological-driven company. So, you know, the, the path that, that I think that the company will go is to, to, to be very, you know, you can do your pre-approvals online. So pretty much they're not going to need, I don't know, they're not going to need loan officers in the future. So I'm looking at it, it's like, should I just, just jump out of it and just go to a different company? And um, the Lord here reminded me that I shouldn't put my trust on any company or I shouldn't look at any other one who is going to a different company. I should put my trust in the Lord because he will be the one uh, who leads my path. I should, he, he is my stability. It's not, any other, it's not any, anybody else or any other company. And I really appreciated that. And it was confirmed to me also on uh, last, last Tuesday when we were studying um, Brother Zach's, um, Brother Zach's um, studies, Brother Joshua was talking about the conflict of uh, Abraham and Lot, and how you know how Abraham didn't want to, you know, Abraham wanted to uh, seek for peace, and Abraham just let Lot pick, you know, his whatever side that he wanted to go, and he, he, picked, he ended up picking the, the, the land of Jordan. And um, for me, it was a reminder that a reminder that Lord was telling me, Arnaldo. Just don't pick the company that you want to go. Let me lead you there. If you pick, you're going to end up like Lot in a land that is, is you know, it's destroyed. But if you're like Abraham, if you let me show you where you're going to go, then I will bless you. And I, I'm, I, and I really appreciate, um, you know, uh, hearing that um, from Brother Joshua and, and meditating on this verse. Thank you. And we'll have Shaji come here and share it. Uh, Isaiah 33, 6. Uh, he will be the stability of your times, the wealth of salvation, wisdom and knowledge, and the fear of the Lord will be his treasure. 
uh, when I started thinking about this uh, verse, it was kind of not easy for me to understand how I can reflect it into my life. And so and then I remembered an advice that we had received from the elders and brothers like that whenever we find a verse that is not so easy to understand, we should go back to the dictionary. And the dictionary that we have is, uh, God has given is Christ himself and his life. And so I started thinking about Christ and 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 uh, how does stability come in? I mean, how was he stable? And what was the foundation of his stability? And uh, if then I was led to consider many things in John's Gospel. And uh, there he makes very bold statements so many places. He says, uh, I, I do everything because the Father is with me. Maybe one verse I will read, John 8, 29. He says, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Pleasing to him. And uh, that was his, uh, uh, I mean, that was the sphere around which his life operated. He said, I always do what my father wants me to do. Never mind what I think about it. Never mind what people think about it is the best need or the greatest need. I don't care. I care only for one thing, what my father wants. And why? Because I want my father to be always be with me. And I want my father to approve whatever I am doing. I mean, for example, in Mark chapter 1, when he was busy having a lot of healings going on, and it could have continued, and people wanted him to continue, even the disciples wanted him to continue, but he heard from the Father that he has to move on, and he moved on. And uh, similarly, when, when he told his brothers that, I am not going to Jerusalem for the, for the feast, but then moments later, the Father told him, you must go. And then he went, without bothering what what will what will my brothers think about me? What I mean, they, will they call me a double-tongued person, one who doesn't do what he says and so on? No. I mean, none of this mattered to him. I mean, his, the only thing that mattered to Jesus was, like what he said to disciples, I have food that, to eat that you do not know about, and my food is to do the will of my Father and to accomplish his work. And that was the reason why he was so stable and secure all the time. He knew that Father who sent him, sent him is with him and he loves him and uh, and and so that uh, i mean uh, that gave me also a context and a, and a real reason i mean to really think about this verse and to apply it in the sense of lord whatever i do on this earth i mean whether it's my job or my home or family or work i mean ev everything put in the context the only thing that matters is am i doing your will are you with me are you looking at me and are you are you pleased with what I am doing? That is all it matters. And uh, and 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 that, that is why even on the day, uh, the, just the day before he was going to the cross, he told the disciples, you have been with me for this three and a half years. But today, you are all going to scatter from me. You are going to leave me and run away. But I am not alone. My father is with me. I mean, that confidence that he had in every point in life, even though he knew he was going to be killed the next day, and even when he was going through the death. And, and that is something that I, I really covet. I really want to meditate more on, and I want to enter into it and say, Lord, in every aspect of my life, my work, my home, and my friends, and family, and everything, please help me to live with that one ambition, that is for you to be with me, for you to be looking at me and say, I am pleased with what you are doing. I want to hear it, Lord. I mean, that is that has become. I mean, that is what I really gathered from. That that is a stability that I want because the stability that we have in this earth that we very often look for stable job. I mean, and good family, good income, whatever. I mean, we can think about as that which gives us stability from an earthly perspective. It, it, it Jesus didn't leave for that, and so we are not. I am not to leave for that, and uh, and in that context, in that same, I. I uh, Isaiah 33, 6. Uh, there, there was this one word that really summarized for me what the stability that he was referring to. That is verse 16. You know, he says, uh, he, meaning the one who seeks to make God as the focal point of everything and doing the will of the Father as everything. He says, he, okay, let me read it this way. 
we we who are seeking to leave that way we will dwell on the heights with god meaning we will dwell with god and and actually that is a title like god from this whole meditation that we will live with god and then we will be stable all the time so we will delve with delve on the heights with god and our refuge will be the impregnable impregnable rock which is god himself that we will run to him, run to him in everything and uh, whenever we are afraid we will be he will be there for us to lean on and and our bread will be given to us by him meaning all our needs he will meet whatever it is and our water will be sure i i take water to interpret everything that we need in our life in terms of spiritual direction and help water being the word of god and everything that we need of sustenance god will give he will give us everything when we make him our focal point and i also want to end with that question that i say uh, the same chapter has in verse 14 there is verse 14 it says who among us can live with the consuming fire who among us can live with continual burning i pray that i'll be able to live in the presence of this fire god is the fire and that is the fire only when my my sin and my lust come into picture the fire comes to burn it and i want to gladly uh, see that fire and, and offer myself to that fire so that everything that is uh, uh, dis, i mean displacing in his sight that can be burned up and then i can be pleasing in that sight and and i thank god for for the example that jesus gave the disciple and the disciple maker who went went ahead of us and uh, I'm, i my faith is increased to live in this in this way that the stability that jesus showed us from his life and what this word uh, explains to us i mean and he will be the stability of your times a wealth of salvation wisdom and knowledge the fear of the lord is his treasure isaiah 33 6 I wanted to share something which encouraged me a lot from this week's memory verse. A lot has happened in the past 7 days since we last met. If we look at the news, there's a lot of news articles that bring about fear, news articles that bring about panic, news articles that bring about sadness. And when I saw this week's memory verse, it was a tremendous encouragement to me to see that the Lord is the stability of our times. In other words, he's not a stability like there's many different choices of finding some place to be stable, but he is the one and only stability of our times. And that's a wonderful encouragement to me. And it encouraged me to see how Isaiah was using this verse in the context as Arnaldo mentioned, this is a chapter that talks about the judgment on Assyria. And Assyria was coming to attack Israel. And Assyrians were known for their cruelty. For example, there's stories of people whom the Syrians have conquered and they would put hooks in the captives noses to lead them away so they're a very scary very cruel type of people and imagine the situation if the Syrians are camped around your city and they've cut off the water supply they've cut off the food supply and they're about to come in imagine how you would feel and it's in this environment that Isaiah comes and he says the lord will be the stability of your times. And and the Lord was true to that because the Lord ended up sending an angel who killed 185,000 Assyrian troops, just one angel. So the Lord was true to that. So it encouraged me to see that wow, Lord, if you can be the stability of times in an environment like that, my problems aren't that bad compared to 185,000 people trying to attack me. You can definitely be the stability of my time. So it challenged me to make this verse personal. and instead of saying the lord will be the stability of your times i want to say the lord will be the stability of my time and i have faith that the lord will definitely do it in my life thank you i want to share from romans chapter 8 verse 37 romans chapter 8 verse 37 <clears throat> in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us I want to share on that phrase, overwhelming conqueror. Some translations say it's more than a conqueror. A few years from now, my kid will go to school, and when he gives tests, he has to pass or fail in the test, right? So let's say there's a math test, and 
it has a passing score of 40 out of 100. And if my kid scores 41 out of 100, how will I react as a father? I'll be happy that he didn't fail. I'll be happy that he passed the test. But I can't say that he passed the test with flying colors because he just got 41. There's so much more for him to grow. Uh, similarly, Paul is saying here that it's not enough for us to just conquer in the midst of our circumstances. We want to be more than conquerors in the midst of our circumstances. And Paul is listing out a few circumstances in this chapter. If you go back to a couple of verses, Romans chapter 8, verse 35, he says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 36, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And then he goes on to say, in all of these circumstances, we're not just conquering, but we are overwhelmingly conquering. He says we are more than conquerors in all of these circumstances. I look at my situations and I ask myself this question, am I more than a conqueror or am I just barely passing the test or worse, am I failing the test? If I'm complaining and grumbling in the midst of my trials, it's very straightforward that I'm failing the test. But if I'm not complaining, but if I'm choosing to submit under God's mighty hand, then God will say that, Josh, you're passing the test but there's so much more that I can do in the midst of my trials. And that's what I want to share today. Uh, God wants me to rejoice in the midst of my circumstances. If I'm not just humbling myself, if I'm not just making peace with my circumstances, but if I'm rejoicing in the midst of my situations, then God will be able to say, I am overwhelmingly conquering in the midst of my circumstances. I've been encouraged to see some examples in the scripture and to see how these people rejoiced when they were afflicted. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 5, verse 40. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. This is talking about the disciples in the early church. It says here, They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. Verse 41 so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame. The apostles were flogged, and they were told not to speak concerning the name of Jesus. They were presented before the council. And in the midst of all of that, we see the apostles rejoicing. They were overwhelmingly conquering their circumstances. We also see Paul's example in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul is writing to the church and he's asking them, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Paul is not writing this letter as a free man. He was in prison when he talked about rejoicing. And I was encouraged to see his example. If Paul could talk about rejoicing being in prison and if apostles could rejoice after being plugged, after being flogged, I believe God can help me rejoice in the midst of my circumstances. I also want to share one more verse from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. Here's a group of believers, and the writer says, For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. These people are not apostles. These people are not Paul and Peter. They're just ordinary group of believers. But it says about them that when their property was seized, they accepted joyfully. They didn't just uh, say, I'll submit under God's mighty hand. They didn't just say, well, things are this way. I'll accept them. They said they rejoiced that their property was being seized. And it's the same God who worked wonders in the life of these people, the same God who helped them rejoice in the midst of their circumstances, I believe will help me also to rejoice. And I don't want to settle down for just making peace with my circumstances. I don't want to settle down. 
um, for just not complaining in the midst of my situations. I want to choose to rejoice. And if I'm not there, I want to ask God for help. Just like I'd help my child. If he's scoring only 41 out of 100, I'll come from, from work early and I'll sit with him and I'll try to help him so that when the next test, he will score higher. And so if I'm finding that I'm just barely passing the test, if I'm finding that I'm not complaining or grumbling, I'm just making peace with my circumstances, but there's no joy in my heart, I want to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. You have done this in the lives of the saints of old, and I believe you can help me rejoice in the midst of my circumstances. I don't want to settle down for a lower score because so much is possible with God's help. Paul gives out the secret of living an overwhelmingly conquering life in Romans 8.37. The later part of that verse says, In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him, who loved us. Paul didn't say we were able to overwhelmingly conquer, but he says we were able to overwhelmingly conquer, conquer through God who loves us. And I want to uh, take to the Lord every time I find that I don't have joy in the midst of a circumstance and say, God, help me. I'm, not, I'm barely passing the test here. I want to be more than a conqueror here. And I believe the Lord uh, will help me.